Well, we're certainly thankful to have our brother and our good friend, Brother Rick Lawson, here to speak to us at this hour. Brother Rick is a native of Pensacola, Florida. He currently is the evangelist of the Adairsville Church of Christ in Adairsville, Georgia. He's been there since 2013. He and his good wife, Mary, have been married for nearly 30 years. They have two children, Timothy, who is 26, and Anna Marie, who is 21. He's been preaching the gospel for over 25 years, graduated from the Memphis School of Preaching in 1999, and served as former president of the MSOP Alumni Association. And if you were at our alumni dinner last evening, you know that he was selected as the Outstanding Alumnus for the Outstanding Alumnus Award for 2020. He's preached for congregations in Tennessee, Arkansas, and Georgia, and he's also serving as an instructor of the Marietta and Adairsville campuses of the Georgia School of Preaching. His topic this hour is, His Message Magnifies His Name. I am so grateful that you are here, grateful that I'm here. It's a been a great week. It has been an unbelievable week. Some of that probably is due to the circumstances, not having a lectureship last year and then this year's lectureship being postponed and the dates being changed a little bit. But I think that's relatively minor when it comes to some of the memories that we make here this week. Already I have met new friends that were already part of my spiritual family that I didn't even know. I've seen friends that I see on a regular basis in other places, but here they are here this week. What a treat that is. And this week I have rekindled friendships from years ago that are so precious, so wonderful. I appreciate the opportunity to be here on this particular lectureship. And I know that you love God and you love His Word because here you are Wednesday afternoon at the Miff School of Preaching Lectureship when you could be taking a nap somewhere. So we are so glad that you are here. We're thankful that we can get together and study the Word of God. You know, when we love God, we have to love His Word. That is the method that God has chosen to communicate His will to mankind. Now God is the God of creation. He's smarter than us. And what that means is He could have chosen any way He wanted to reveal His will to us. As a matter of fact, down through the stream of time, He's used all kinds of different methods. Dreams and visions and miracles. Today He's given us His Word so that we can read it and understand it and apply it to our lives so that we can be the way He wants us to be and ultimately go to be with Him in heaven one day when this life is over and the judgment is past. This is God's Word because it originated in God's mind. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That means that the words in your Bible did not originate in the mind of man. As a matter of fact, that would have been impossible, wouldn't it? I was thinking recently that one of the reasons it is impossible for the Bible to, be the, to come from the mind of man is because when it comes to writing the Bible, men couldn't do it even if they would, and they wouldn't do it even if they could. They couldn't do it because if you think about the 66 books of the Bible written by about 40 different men over about 15 hundred years and look at the perfect unity and harmony of the message that you find there. You can't get men of the sa in the same room to agree on everything and yet all these men just happen to agree on everything they wrote over all that period of time. Impossible. 
Men couldn't do it even if they would. But they wouldn't do it even if they could. Let me illustrate this by looking at the conduct that we have recorded in the Word of God about a couple of kings. One that was very good and one that was very bad. First of all, King David, well beloved, so beloved by his people, and yet you read 2 Samuel chapter 11, and you read God's Word that records some of the most terrible mistakes that were made by this good and beloved man. Would men do that if that, weren't, if that wasn't in the mind of God to record that for us? Men wouldn't write that about David. And on the other hand, you have a king like Manasseh. Manasseh was the oldest son of Hezekiah, who was a good king. <clears throat> but Manasseh started very young. I believe he was 12 years old when he started to reign. He must have listened to some poor counselors because the vast majority of, his, of uh, Manasseh's reign was terrible. He set up high places, began to encourage the people of God to worship uh, false gods again and did everything he could to tear the Word of God down. Terrible, terrible king until right at the end. He served 55 years as king in Jerusalem. And right at the end, if you read Second Chronicles chapter 30, uh, 33, especially beginning in verse uh, about down there around somewhere around verse number 12, the Bible says that he learned his lesson and realized that God was God and prayed for forgiveness, and prayed that God would bless him and his people. And he tore down the altars of the false gods, and set up the worship again to God, and pleaded with the people to worship the one true and living God. They wouldn't listen. But there, at the very end of his life, this terrible king repented. You know, some of his acts are recorded also in 2 Kings. And whoever wrote 2 Kings didn't say a word about his repentance. Only the bad things. If that were just up to men, they'd have probably just wrote about how terrible he was. But God wanted you to know Manasseh repented. Man wouldn't write that even if he could. I'm thankful we have the Word of God. God's ultimate message to mankind is His Holy Word. And that Word, His message magnifies His name. Before the lesson's over, I hope to show you the difference between magnifying a beetle and magnifying beetle juice. But that's at the end. Let's start by talking about some of the ways that His message magnifies His name. Number one, think about the word character. What would you know about the character of God were it not for His message. You might know some things by looking at creation, but i tell you this, today the very best way to learn about the character of God is by reading His message. Because that tells us who God is and how He interacts with man and what He expects of us and how He responds to the way that we act. The Word of God reveals His character. You know something else about God that I think is unique to God? The more you know Him, the more you will love Him. Do you ever have anybody that made a great first impression on you? And then every time you met them afterwards, it just went downhill from there. <laughs> There are very few people who make a great first impression and then continue that as long as you know them. But that's how God is. The more you love Him, the more you know Him, the more you love Him. What does the Bible show us about God's character that magnifies His name? Well, in the first place, the Bible shows us His great power. The very first words of the Bible demonstrate the great power of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Man couldn't do that. You don't believe it? Just try to create something sometime. Somebody says, well, I'm an artist. I create art. No, you take paper and scratch, you know, crayons on it or whatever your medium is. You might create, you know, something out of your mind and put it on a page. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the creation of God. 
Men say, I build societies. Nebuchadnezzar tried that, didn't he? Look at this great Babylon, which I have built. Brother Liddell preached on that yesterday. Great, great message. He didn't build Babylon. Man is good about rearranging things that God has already given him and then getting the big head about it. But they're not really creating anything. We're just rearranging things. See, God is the one who creates things. Jeremiah 10, verse number 12, the Bible says, He hath made the earth by His power. He hath established the world by His wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by His discretion. That's why near the close of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 4, verse number 11, you see those 24 elders in John's vision of heaven falling down before the throne of God and crying this, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and power and honor, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. God is a God of power. And that magnifies His name. Number two. We also learn from his message, his great compassion for men. Aren't you glad that we serve a God that is moved by compassion? That goes all the way back near the beginning too. Ask yourself this, what did Adam and Eve deserve? Destruction. But that's not what they got. They got grace. They got another chance. That gives me hope. Because I need God's compassion too. What about the children of Israel? that got out there and God blessed them over and over and over and delivered them from their taskmasters. And what did they do? Murmured and complained and whined and moaned and said, we don't want to listen to Moses. And what did God do? Compassion. They deserved annihilation. God gave them grace and love. Over and over and over, God, God's Word reveals His compassion. Psalm 86 and verse 15, But Thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. Also Psalm 145 and verse number 8, The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord during his day. Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 8. The Israelites returned from captivity in a foreign land. Why? Because of God's love and compassion for them. God said in Jeremiah 30 and verse number 11, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of the nations whither I have scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. God said, I'm going to destroy some nations, but not you. Because Christ is coming through you. He didn't say that here, but that was the reason. And he was moved with compassion. And of course, the ultimate demonstration of God's love, mercy, and compassion is Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Romans 5, verse 8, But God commendeth his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That is a God of compassion. Then also his word shows us his great knowledge and wisdom. God is an omniscient God, and the Bible tells us that. Psalm 147, verses 4 and 5, He telleth us the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our God and of great power. His understanding is infinite. You go to school, you keep learning. There's a cap somewhere. Man can only know so much. God's not like that. God knows everything. His knowledge, His understanding, His wisdom is infinite. I wonder if Paul was thinking about that when he penned Romans chapter 11, verses 33 and 34. Oh, the depth and the riches of both the wisdom and the knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out! For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been His counselor? See, God doesn't need our advice. He doesn't need our counseling. He doesn't have any problems to go to a counselor. The only problems God has is us. <laughs> when we sin, when we're disobedient to God. God has great knowledge and wisdom. 
God knows the secrets and hearts of men, according to Psalm 44, verse 21. And His knowledge far exceeds ours. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Don't put yourself in a contest with God. You're going to lose. You're not smarter than Him. Men who try to sit down and figure out their own plan of salvation or what they think's right and wrong, you're not going to beat God in a contest of wits. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And so God is a God of knowledge. But also think about this. The Bible shows us the character of God by showing us His great sense of justice. Man has an idea that he wants God to be all love, all kindness, all grace. Well, God is those things, but He is also a God of justice. The Bible says that our God is a jealous God. He is a consuming fire. And God is a God of justice. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy shall go, uh, mercy and truth shall go before thy faith, Psalm uh, 89, verse number 14. And so God is both. Some people try to have one side and reject the other. It won't work. People like to fashion God according to their own ideas and give God the character, characteristics that they wish He had. A lot of, pe a lot of people are hopeful atheists. <laughs> they say they're atheists. Really what they're hoping is there is no God they have to answer to. Jesus spoke of the judgment day also as a time of denial, didn't He? Matthew 7, verses 23, 22 and 23. Many will say in me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Thy name, and in Thy name cast out devils, and in Thy name done many wonderful works? And I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Too late to try to find out the truth on the judgment day. That's why I gave you the shot now. This is the proving ground for the soul. God's Word magnifies His name by showing us His character. I'm so thankful for that. Number two, I want you to think about creation. The Bible reveals to us God's hand in creation, and that magnifies His name. Friends, especially preachers, personal workers, elders, deacons in the church, I believe that we have moved into a new area, a new era of outreach and personal evangelism. A few decades ago, you could go around in your communities and you could find God-fearing people that at least had a concept of who God was and they were familiar with many of the facts that the Bible teaches. They just didn't know how to put them all together. And we could take a person like that with a good, honest heart and sit down with them and in just a few lessons show them how all those puzzle pieces that they already had would click right together and baptize them and bring them, bring them right into the family. But you know what you find when you go through the communities today? Even here in the Bible Belt, so-called Bible Belt, you find young people have no concept of the God of the Bible. You, you find young people now completely ignorant of many of the accounts that the Bible teaches that we teach our little uh, cradle roll kids. They know nothing. What does that mean when it comes to evangelism? We're going to have to teach them about God, the very existence of God, who God was, how we got to where we are today, and how they need to respond to the God of the Bible. And that comes through creation. Exodus chapter 22 and verse number 11, the Bible says, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and earth and the sea and all in them, that, in, the, in them that is and rested on the seventh day. A lot of people have no idea that. Or they have rejected it due to what they're being taught in the schools about evolution. We need to be able to teach people about creation. We need to show people what God did in the physical realm. You know, we already talked about 
what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1. By the way, that's not a myth or a legend. That's just as much truth as John 3.16. We need to be holding that up for people to see. Think about the law of gravity. You ever, we don't have to think about it much, do we? Holds everything together. It keeps this old earth circling the sun. It holds our atmosphere in and the very planet together. But you go ask some kind of physicist to explain gravity for you. They have no idea. It is the weakest of the four fundamental forces that science explains. And, they, and yet, this whole universe depends on it. They have no idea what makes it tick or how to change it or anything else. The force of gravity applies itself to infinity. There is no space where two bodies with mass don't affect one another. And you can build the thickest wall you want between it. It won't stop the force of gravity. Science has no idea about that. I've got some of that in the manuscript. I don't care what scientists know or don't know. God knows it all. He's the one who created all that. In the physical realm, everything we have depends upon what God has done for us through His creation. The air that we breathe, the food that we eat, everything that we have in this world, we need to be thankful for God. God is the one who gave us all those things. His Word teaches us that. Even mankind was created to magnify the glory of God. The Bible says in Isaiah 43, verses 6 and 7, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth, even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. As a matter of fact, man was the only part of God's creation that was made in his image. Genesis 1 and verse number 27. No surprise then that Jesus said in Matthew 5 and verse number 16, Let your light shine. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And no wonder that Paul instructs all Christians to do all things to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse number 31. And so the physical realm of creation is seen we see his message, but also the spiritual realm. God didn't just create physical things. He created spiritual things as well. Throughout the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit foretold over and over and over again of a coming spiritual kingdom. Daniel wrote, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like unto the Son of God, unto the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven. And came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Daniel seven, thirteen and 14. The only person that can create a kingdom that will last forever is God. Men have tried it. Where's Babylon? Where's Greece? Where's Rome? These kingdoms are gone. God created a spiritual kingdom, one that would last forever. The Bible says that Jesus promised to establish that kingdom. Matthew 16, verse number 18, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Immediately he told the apostles he would give them the keys to the kingdom. They used those kingdoms first in Acts chapter 2 when they preached the gospel plan of salvation for the first time. And then those that obeyed and all who have obeyed since that time have been translated into that kingdom. Colossians 1 and verse number 13. The head of the church, the head of the kingdom is Christ. He's the one who has preeminence in all things, Colossians 1, verse number 18. And that fact, that fact shows that the spiritual kingdom that God established magnifies His name. And then also, on the spiritual side of things, you look into that heavenly realm. Men have been given glimpses. 
Ezekiel chapter 1, the prophet had a vision of heaven. He fell on his face and had to be set upon his feet by the one who spoke to him. Ezekiel 1 verse 28 and following. Isaiah was shown a vision of the Lord on his heavenly throne. What did he say in Isaiah chapter 6 verse number 5? Woe is me for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. You see, God didn't just create the things that we can see. He created the things that you can't see. He created the spiritual realm just like He did the physical realm. Revelation chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. The Bible says uh, John was able to look up there in, in the, uh, at least by the Spirit, and it says, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The city had no need of the sun, neither the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. The Lamb is the light thereof. I submit to you, you wouldn't know a thing about that heavenly side of creation if the Bible didn't reveal it. If His message didn't show us that so that we could glorify and magnify His name. Number three, I've got to hurry along. Think about the care that God provides. God gives us everything we need in this life. My God shall supply all your need according to the riches, uh, His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4 Verse number 19, when Adam and Eve were created and placed in the garden, they had everything that they needed. Genesis 2, verse number 9. When the children of Israel went out into the wilderness, they were given food and water despite their murmuring and complaining. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse number 20. They were eventually ushered into a land that flowed with milk and honey. God cares about His people. So Christians are told, Matthew 6, 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The context there is the physical necessities of life. God says, I'll give you everything that you need in the physical sense, but also in the spiritual sense. God provides for us spiritually. Soon as sin entered into the world... God began to reveal His scheme of redemption. Genesis 3, 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so with that promise, man could begin looking for a Savior. His greatest need that he ever had. It, that he ever had. The same message that magnifies the name of God also provides all of man's spiritual needs. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 3. Thanks to God's love for man, He's provided everything that we need for our physical well-being and also for our spiritual well-being. Man doesn't deserve that. And so that fact magnifies the name of God. Then finally, I want you to think about how His message magnifies His name when we think about the culmination of all things. The word culmination is defined by Oxford as the highest or climactic point of something, especially as attained over a long time. Friend, this world is winding down. There are a lot of errors being taught out there right now in the world in general and sadly even in the church about end times. And so when we think about the culmination of all times, we need to remember that God deserves the glory. We need to hold up the truth on these things. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children's unto the third and fourth generation. Numbers 14, 18. Despite God's patience and long-suffering, though, things are winding down. This world has been moving to an ultimate climax. And in this context, that is destruction. Jesus is coming back. He promised His disciples that He was going to return. 
John 14 and verse number 3, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. By the way, that's still yet in the future. He hasn't come back. Not yet, but he's coming one day and you can count on it. He promised the disciples that he would return and when he comes back, he's not coming by himself. The holy angels will accompany him, Matthew 16, 27. The angels will sort out the wicked from the righteous, Matthew chapter 13 and verse 49. The Lord will bring the souls of the righteous dead with him too. The Bible says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse number 14. The Lord's second coming is not going to be a secret because the Bible says that every eye will see Him, Revelation 1, verse number 7. And on that last day when the Lord comes back, the dead will be raised. The Bible says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation, John 5, 28-29. When on that great day, the Bible says the heavens and earth are going to pass away and melt with fervent heat. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 7 and 10. John was shown the judgment day through the eye of prophecy. He said in Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by the things which are written in the books according to their works. You see, the Lord's coming back. He's going to burn up the world and we're going to stand before Him in judgment. All of death, all of the dead are going to be raised and we're going to give account of the choices that we've made. The Bible says that very clearly in Romans chapter 14 and verse number 12. Everyone who has ever lived is going to give an account of the law under which they lived. We don't live under the patriarchy. We don't live under the law of Moses. We live under the Christian dispensation. All have. Since Acts chapter 2 and the days following the preaching of the gospel to all man mankind, you couldn't live under the law of Moses today if you wanted to. It's been taken out of the way, being nailed to the cross. Colossians 2 verse 14. So we've got to be ready for that day. Heaven and earth are going to pass away and we're going to stand before God in judgment. After the judgment, the final sentence shall be passed, and the wicked and the righteous shall go to their eternal destinies. Sometimes they do these religious surveys in the community, and they ask the question, do you believe in hell? Do you believe in heaven? The number who believe in heaven are always higher than the numbers who believe in hell. I can't understand it. Jesus taught the same about both. The same one who taught about heaven taught about hell. He warned about that, didn't he? The Bible says, Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Matthew 20, uh, 25, 34. Those who have not obeyed the soul-saving gospel, sadly, will find a very different fate. The Bible says in Revelation 20, verse number 15, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Every step in God's plan to culminate the events in this physical world magnifies His name. He's the one in control. Not me, not you, not any man. God is the one in control. Because of that message, the name of God is magnified among His people. I don't know about you, when I think about magnifying something, I think about something like a little beetle that might be crawling across this podium here, and I whip out my magnifying glass, and I hold it up to that beetle, and it makes something tiny seem bigger. You can see all the little details in that bug if you hold the magnifying glass just right. That's not the way we magnify God. When we magnify the name of God, we're not making something small appear bigger. Some men may think that, but that's not the truth. Rather than looking at a beetle under a magnifying glass, 
When we magnify God, it's like looking at Betelgeuse. You know what that is? <laughs> That's a star in the constellation of Orion. Scientists classified as a red giant. Because it is estimated that the star Betelgeuse is a thousand times bigger than our sun. Just to help you wrap your mind around that, if it were to somehow be put in place of our sun, the diameter of the star Betelgeuse would extend out beyond the orbit of Jupiter. That's how big it is. Doesn't seem that big up in the sky, but it's 700 light years away from Earth. That means 700 years it would take light to travel from here to the star Betelgeuse. Or the reverse is true as well. And if you want to get a closer look at Betelgeuse, you have to magnify it. And so you get you a telescope. And right now it just looks like a tiny little speck up in the sky. It is the tenth brightest star that you can see at night. But if you put a big old telescope in front of your eye, you can magnify that which is bigger than your imagination. And you can see more details about it. And come to appreciate it more. That's what it's like when we magnify God. We're looking at beetle juice, not a beetle. We see more detail of that which is bigger than we can imagine so that we can appreciate it more. We'll never know all there is to know. But as God's people, we can continue to search His Word, study His Word so that we can magnify His name. Men of God are blessed to be able to preach that message. And so, we'll keep on magnifying His name and teaching others to do that very same thing. So that one day, when the Lord does come back, He will find us ready. You know what? We don't know when that is. We don't know when that will be. The Lord might hold off another hundred or a thousand or who knows how many years. We don't know. He could come back before this day is over. We don't know when that is. But God says, you just keep on living a holy life. You just keep on doing what Christians are supposed to do. Studying His Word on a regular basis and doing the things that His Word commands. Because when He comes back, His name is going to be magnified. Every eye will see Him and every knee will bow. You know, the Bible says now that every knee should bow, but on that day every knee shall bow. And His name will be magnified, and there won't be any choosing then. There won't be any choice on that day. God's name should be magnified now. And I'm thankful that we have the opportunity to come here and do it together. We love God. We love His Word. And His message magnifies His name. Thank you for your kind attention this afternoon as we study the Word of God together.